skeptics in the hubbers here we are again i think this is our 12th ep episode since lockdown and i can see that i've frozen a bit on screen but uh, we're struggling with the technology again i am assuming that you can hear me and i have a great guest tonight professor sophie scott she is professor of a neuroscientific department of UCL, University College London. And cross your fingers, here she comes. Hello, Sophie. Hi, I think my computer, my internet just collapsed then, so I've just changed onto a different dongle. So I should be okay. good then. Well, we're working at the moment, so keep your fingers crossed. Yes. Sophie Scott, professor of, tell me about it. Tell us, tell the viewers. So it's called cognitive neuroscience and what that basically means is kind of like as a kind of weaponized psychology so what we use is a lot more tech stuff than we normally associate with psychology but that's because we've got new techniques so we use lots of things like functional magnetic resonance imaging and um, functional near red infrared spectroscopy and uh, MEG so lots and lots of different brain imaging techniques as well as classic techniques where we work with patients Try and understand how the brain works and how that relates to behavior the, the neuroscientist that i've uh, been familiar with before uh, is sam harris is he in the same field as you i think broadly yeah i think that's how you describe it it's a fairly eclectic church i'd say cognitive neuroscience mm -hmm. and that is one of the things i like about it is it's very our psychology is it's very interdisciplinary science so what does the cognitive bit mean well, um, I wouldn't start picking at that thread too much. What it basically means is you're, you're kind of describing things at the level of systems. So we're not looking at individual neurons. We're looking at brain networks. And I think the cognitive bit is a nod to the fact that we're interested in stuff that makes sense in terms of people's experience and behavior. So um, yeah, there's lots and lots of neuroscience that has much more to do with, for example, how you know, cell membrane potentials are maintained or how you can transport molecules across cell membranes. Excellent areas of neuroscience doesn't relate to behavior in quite that same one-to-one -one mapping so that's the kind of level we're at now you've been on the um uh, jim al khalili's life scientific haven't you and that's still available I'll, I'll put a link to that in the comments after this event is over uh, but you've also presented the royal institution's christmas lectures i believe and I, I'm afraid that's no longer available. It might come back, but at the moment it's not on um, iPlayer. You can get it if you go to the Royal Institution itself. You get links to all of the of, all of the things for which the lectures for which le uh, tapes exist. So you just have to get to it, get to it via the Royal Institution itself, and they're all there. Mm -hmm. So I want to start with a challenging question. Can we agree that the mind is the business of the brain in the same way that the function of a muscle is to contract? I'd say that it's a property of the brain. I think that the brain probably is more than that. Um, a lot of the things that your brain does are things not only that you're not really conscious of, that you probably could never really achieve consciousness of. Um, and I think that means that it's, they have an interesting relationship, but you won't necessarily expect the mapping to be one to one because a lot of what the brain's doing wouldn't necessarily fit with what we think of as men, uh, the properties of the mind. So maybe mental, maybe something more general. It's just, you know, it, that, that's sort of capturing, I don't know, perhaps something that includes all the really low level vegetative stuff as well as the more high level conceptual experiential side of the brain processes. The autonomic system. Yeah. And things like um well you know, when i'm talking to you i'm i have awareness of sort of what i want to say and roughly how i want to say it but i have no real awareness of how i'm controlling my intercostal muscles to make that happen but actually i'm performing incredibly precise movements in my intercostal muscles to make mm. speech possible at all and that's quite you know and at one level well i don't you know i don't if you had to think about it all then you'd never be able to do anything but mm. we tend to think of the mind as comprising more of that kind of, you know, the, the sort of stuff we can relate to conceptually. And I'm, I'm happy to, you know, I may well have misdefined mind here. So I'm happy to be wrong on that. Yes. It's a bit like walking, but much more complicated. 
Yes. You so everywhere you, you look, there's stuff that you're doing all the time. You've got no idea how your brain's <laughs> pulling it off. Yeah, well, that's right. You start by realizing that you have to put one foot in front of the other. But then soon you don't have to think about that at all. Yep, absolutely. So I believe you've prepared a presentation for it. I have, and I'm just going to share that to the screen. So just make sure that I've got it says it use two monitors, but I don't have two monitors. Um no, I've my had applications. Well. <laughs> well. Mm. Here we go. My lovely new computer has decided not to come on. <laughs> Here we go. So I'm going to talk about brains and sex and getting brain sex wrong. So myths about mm. having sex on the mm. brain. Is there a difference? Vive la différence, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes okay. it's more complicated than that. Yes. I'm going to disappear and Thank put you. your, your slides full screen, but we'll still be able to hear your voice over. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you. So I'm going to talk about some of the complexities around what happens when we as scientists try to answer questions about um, male and female brains and often how the way that we start even framing the question starts to influence some of the, the difficulties in interpreting what we actually find. So I'm calling this getting brain sex wrong because actually I think we do get it wrong a lot of the time, partly because we take extreme positions, partly because sometimes we just do studies that don't quite pass a too much hard thinking. So humans are sexually dimorphic animals. Sexual dimorphism is extremely common in nature. It just means you have different bodies based on your biological sex. I'm not talking about whether you're gay or straight. I am not talking about whether what your gender identity is, your sense of a gender. This is just the the sort of the basic biology that's the relationship between your, your genes and the kind of gametes you produce if you produce and that sort of thing. So very kind of basic biological approach to this, but then that helps because those differences are big and they're big in bodies for us to ask questions about the brain as well. So the starting point for a lot of approaches to understanding the effect of your biological sex on your brain and how your brain works and what your brain looks like starts from this starting point that we have this dimorphism in the adult male and female bodies, do we find something similar at the brain level? It's, it's that sort of simple. So the same hormonal influences and genetic influences that give you these different bodies, that they're having their same effect on what your brain looks like and how your brain works. So these are just a couple of physical sexual dimorphic traits, one of which is height. There is quite a marked difference in height between adult men and adult women. That does not mean to say you don't encounter some tall, male sort of female individuals or some short male individuals and you can see here in the kind of pink and blue where you see some overlap but there is quite marked difference between the average height for adult women and the average height for adult men and of course it doesn't stop there there's also different um, lung capacity in men men have bigger lung capacity men have much greater muscle strength particularly upper body strength there's some argument that women excel less at a uh, sort of speed and strength sports against men, but more endurance sports. But you, you find in these difference physically in how the body works and what the body looks like. There are other areas of sexual dimorphism. So in fact, an even bigger aspect of sexual dimorphism for adult humans, where there are, you do find mammals that are much, much more marked in the sexual dimorphism of male and female bodies, is the human voice. So in adult human men, males and females, you have a very different frequency range and um, vocal characteristics. And that's because males and females have descended larynxes. This is unique to humans. We have a permanently descended larynx, which gives us our voices. But then in adolescence, men, male individuals have this secondary descent to the larynx. So men have got this prominent invisible Adam's apple. This gives an adult man a much longer pipe to make the sounds of speech and a larger larynx that makes lower frequencies. So it's a very, it's a, it's a very marked difference. So basically what has happened in, in sort of brain sciences and psychology, there's been a lot of interest in taking this forward into saying, well, does that help us explain behavioral differences between men and women? Well, what sort of behavioral differences will be trying to argue about? There's been a long standing interest in, for example, sex differences and IQ. It's not a literature that has always covered itself in glory, I'd say more generally, the IQ literature. There is a small advantage for men at the upper end of the IQ distribution. So this is just a, a standard, a lot, a lot of people, men and fem 
male and female individuals who've taken a standardized intelligence test, you actually look at the mean, there's not much of a difference. There is a slight uh, predominance of men at the upper end, not particularly at the lower end. But what you're, you wouldn't look at that and say that looks sexually dimorphic in the same way that height does. You're not seeing quite such a marked difference in the overlaps of the two. So just to show you height again, to remind you. Um, there are other sort of specific cognitive tests that keep cropping up as being different in men and women. Uh, so men tend to be better at what's called mental rotation than women. So here, if you can see these two figures here, with those two shapes, when you look at them, if you rotate them such that they're similarly aligned, are they those two shapes the same or different? That's a mental rotation task. And men tend to be faster at that and tend to be more accurate at that. These are men and women doing a task like this. And what you see is there is, a, that's the advantage, the males are doing better than the females, but again, the actual dimorphism is not great in terms of the, the way that this is playing out in terms of a difference. They are getting as much variation amongst the men as you're getting between the men and the women, if not more. And that's very, very common. Whenever you find a cognitive thing like IQ or mental rotation, you find these, they find small differences, but are largely overlapping distributions. Um, another very commonly argued cognitive difference between men and women is that women excel at language skills. Um, this is, uh, crops up along a number of different dimensions. There's been a historically quite a lot of interest in whether or not men or women talk more. And this is, uh, you know, maybe women are better at language skills, maybe they will talk more than men. And this is a meta-analysis of studies of men and women and how much they speak. And what this study found was that, this is a meta-analysis of lots of studies that are out there, is that there is a difference, and the difference is that men talk more than women. But here they actually say in the meta-analysis, given the small average effect sizes, i.e. there's a difference, but it's tiny, we stress that men and women's verbal behavior is generally quite similar. So even in a classic area like language, we're not seeing the big differences we might expect to find. And if anything, it's going in the opposite direction whereby men talk more than women. Now, why does this matter before we actually get to the brains itself? Well, it matters because there are still lots of areas of life where women and men are not found in the same numbers. And this matters for things like areas where we really worry a lot about the diversity and that things like STEM subjects, there has historically been difficulty getting women into STEM topics and keeping women in STEM topics. By no means is this restricted just to male female differences. There are lots of other things, but I'm constraining myself to that right now. And I've been to several um, meetings at the Royal Society where people have talked about this and why is, why is there this disparity between men and women in say, you know, engineering, or computer sciences, uh, you'll notice not there in biology particularly. Um, and there's a couple of, I guess, must be fellows of the Royal Society who always kind of turn up and say, well, it's not the nature of women to be interested in science. It's not, uh, we're never gonna find the same number of women that want to do science as, as men that want to do science because women's brains just don't work that way. They're not interested in it, they don't want to do it. And there is a pervasive belief in this that somehow it's not something we can worry about too much because it's just brains work differently. And uh, for example, Simon Baron Cohen is a big fan of that kind of argument. It's not a male female difference, it's just sort of different sorts of brains. So if we really start to drill down into this, can we find something that might give us an answer if we start looking at sex differences and the brain? Well, there are differences between men's brains and female brains. So male and female brains are not the same. Male brains are larger than female brains, and that remains true even after we control for body size. So that's quite striking. That is, we have a bigger, expensive bit of kit up inside the skull of men, and that is not explained away by the fact that men are simply physically larger. In contrast, if we look at women's brains, what we tend to find is that proportionally women's brains on average contain more a greater proportion of gray matter than white matter relative to men's brains. Gray matter is the computational part of brains and the white matter is the connectivity. So what you might be seeing in female brains is the same proportional amount of gray matter fitted into a smaller space by having these shorter connections. Now you could consider that to be a more efficient brain, but I wouldn't possibly want to comment. <laughs> 
But at least it's possible that even if there are these big differences between the size of brains in male brains and female brains, that it could still even out if we take it down to the computational bit of the brain. Historically, one of the things people have looked at this a lot is in terms of brain damage. And there's certainly, for example, has been a very persistent, rather popular theory coming out of America that says men and women have got different lateralization of language. In the vast majority of adult humans, language is a left lateralized phenomenon. This is one of the things that I work on. And it's, it's very, very marked. And in fact, what we find is you either have left or right representation of language, you don't have a mix. However, this theory from America has said for years, well, one of the reasons why women are held to be, although they're not always, better at language tasks than men is because they are more bilateral in how language is represented. So there's been a lot of interest in this and people, you know, you know, good scientists have been making this argument on, I think, rather thin data. So for example, if we look at patterns of brain damage, you might predict if women really have got language on both sides of the brain, well, they should have a different outcome from strokes, the sorts of strokes that normally give us very profound patterns of problems with language when they happen on the left. And that's not the case. Women do not recover better from strokes than men, and it makes no difference at all to their recovery from a phasic stroke. That's a stroke that's affected your language. Um, there is no benefit. There is no evidence that women are in any way protected from the effects of stroke. And in fact, if anything, Unfortunately, women tend to do less well than men after strokes, and that's almost entirely because they tend to be less physically fit. They have less strong cardiovascular systems, which are one of the stroke is a disease of the cardiovascular system, and a healthier cardiovascular system will result in a healthier brain and some more resilience to stroke. Similarly, women are in anything more adversely affected by Alzheimer's disease than men. They tend to get it more frequently, they tend to get it in a more severe way. So there is no suggestion at all that there is a difference between men and women, whereby women are in some way protected from brain damage. If anything, men seem to have somewhat slightly better outcomes, but that's more to do probably with physical fitness and activity. Here's an example of this kind of bilaterality study and how people's keenness on it. Um, what you see here are different studies that have compared language lateralization or tried to, again, going back to this idea that women somehow have more language on both sides of the brain. And this is a measure of studies that are finding more lateralization in women and studies that are finding less lateralization in women. And the bigger the square, the more participants there were in the study. And what you're seeing is a very classic effect here, which is the smaller the study, the more likely it is showing you a result that tips in the direction of women having a different lateralization to men, i.e. the smaller the study, the more likely it is that you're picking up noise. So the vote count analysis revealed that the studies that reported a sex difference had smaller sample sizes than studies with negative findings. So what do we need? What we need is studies that have many, many, many more participants in. I'm going to show you some of those now. So this is an example of that sexual dimorphism in terms of total volume of the brain that I was mentioning before. And this comes from a study that has, has something fantastic in it, like 3,000 participants. It's quite extraordinary. So there you're seeing something again. Now that looks like sexually dimorphic structure. You're seeing a difference in the total brain volume between the men and the women. It's, rather sweetly everyone keeps going with blue and pink for those there we are that's what we're seeing now what was interesting about this study was it didn't just leave it there what they did was they drilled down and they asked questions about distinct brain areas because your brain is not one homogeneous mass it's made up of lots of different nuclei and functionally different areas are the differences between those for men and women um so they did find these, but when you start to go down to these smaller structures, what you find is the effects start to get really small again, even when you have many, many participants. So these are examples of brain areas that showed sexual dimorphism by the definition of this study. So here in the pallidum and the putamen, and these are areas of subcortical fields within, um, sort of sitting around the brain stem underneath the gray matter mantle of the brain, you're seeing differences, it has to be said, they are now not large. The effect sizes, in other words, are small. And again, the variation between the men and the women is much greater. So within women, there's much more variation than there is between men and women. And you're seeing that everywhere. And that wasn't the trace for, case for height, and it wasn't the case for brain size. And some of them are very, very small indeed. 
fine, okay, but there could still be some other things going on here. But, you know, I, I can remember when the authors of this paper say, well, what would you want sexual dimorphism to be? And I was like, well, bigger than this, bigger than something that you need 3,000 people to start to see even a small effect. Um, so in this more recent study with the same database, um, this is the Biobank study, I think, what they did was they added in questions that actually addressed functional aspects of people's lives that might affect how their brains work. So now we're getting a little bit more subtle. We've got male brains and we've got female brains. And now we're also going to take in other aspects of these people's lives. So these are the sorts of traits that are being picked up on the, this biobank study, data that's being collected by, about people in addition to these brain images. And they're things like, what's their job? Do you have a job? Is it a social job or not a social job? Are you satisfied with your friends? Are you satisfied with your family? Are you satisfied with your household? Well, sorry, what's your household size? Well, who do you live with? Do you live alone? For some reason, those are different questions. Um, do you have siblings? Do you have romantic partners? Do you have social support that's low or high? Are you a member of a sports club? Do you take place, part in a weekly social activity? How lonely are you? What's your income? What's your health care? And health care is a sort of proxy for income. And then they grouped these in terms of different sorts of determinants of aspects of social processing, because they were particularly in the, interested in the idea that there'd be differences in the social brain networks for men and women. So here we've got these ideas about a sympathy group outside your home life, so friends and job. Family satisfaction is associated with inner support group. Um, so, so the stuff immediately around you, that's true for whether or not you live alone, your siblings, romantic partners, rather confusing. They count back out with uh, friendships and job. I'm certainly I'm made of questions there, actually. Anyway, but that's they've, they've grouped it differently from the people you live with and different again from the so sports club. Again, that's part of your outer world. Uh, so the, and then you've got socioeconomic status down here. So they're pulling out these factors. And what they did in this study, rather than trying to sort of say, well, here are all the men, here are all the women. They took their men and they took their women and they scored, they found people who, they kind of arranged people by the extremes on these scores. And then they said, well, are the extremes, when we split people up in this way, high and low on these different factors, does that start to pull the brain structures apart? So now we're seeing something to do with people's experience in their social world. Does that affect brain structure and is that modulated by sex? This is a mystifying figure that I still don't think I entirely understand, but I think what this is showing is they normalize for overall brain size. So we're not gonna see just everything being bigger in men's brains because men's brains are bigger. They've normalized for that. And that means that once you normalize, some brain areas then become relatively larger in female brains. And this is how they're breaking it down. So you get these beautiful figures where you identify different brain networks, which they've taken from an existing paper that's identifying social parts of the brain. And they're going in and asking questions about the size of those brain areas and how they are kind of differentiated by these different aspects of people's experience in social worlds. I'll show you these more individually. So this is the kind of thing. So blue is boys, pink is girls again. So here in the amygdala, what you're seeing in the women is that you live in a smaller household, naught to one people, so one, you on your own or with a partner, versus women that live with more than two people, that has a big effect on the volume of the amygdala and it goes, uh, but effectively not really anything for the men, although if you could say here it's the women that live in a bigger household size. Okay, that's interesting. The amygdala is a part of the brain, very involved in social processing, it's both involved in faces, seems to be doing something very different in men and women, but hang on, Ventromedial prefrontal cortex goes in the, well, the opposite direction for the men. We're seeing it go larger for the men who live in the smaller household. So even within the brains, this is not having a uniform and unidirectional effect on larger households, increase the size of this. It's not just moderated by sex, it actually changes in direction. And we keep finding this. So we'd ask a different question about social support. Here, really the effects are being driven by the women with low social support. Here, the effects are being driven by the men just being larger than the women into in this ventromedial area. Again, the question's about family, less family satisfaction, works in different directions for the men and for the women. Whatever is happening here is not simple and it's not unidirectional. And you could imagine that perhaps if we knew a little bit more about the, the kind of collapsing someone's entire family world into this single measure, maybe there is a lot more complexity to ask about this.
Loneliness, again, interestingly, is going largely in a different direction. What looks like a straight down the line sex difference here, the women's amygdalas are larger than the men's, goes in the opposite direction in terms of how it's affecting, being affected by loneliness when we go to this other ventromedial prefrontal cortical field. So a different part of the brain, different response. Same with friendship. Same with romantic partners, although if anything, I'd have to say romantic partners gave you the least interesting profile of anything, uh, partly because uh, they seem to break it down into, do you have one romantic partner or more than two, two or more? And that's just, again, made of questions about this. The questions about the support groups, and now we're collapsing down across these different questions. So again, whatever is happening here, it is not simple and it's not unidirectional. And the brain networks they're investigating, although they've looked at lots of different parts of the brain, come down to quite a small handful. So we've seen the amygdala and ventromedial prefrontal cortex, now we're into the nucleus accumbens. Effectively, the same profile across these different factors. So sports clubs seem to have something in common with social support and healthcare in terms of the profile of responses, which also looks like friendship, siblings and income. So I'm not going to keep belaboring this, but you can start to glimpse from this the degree of complexity of what must actually be underlying this. These are large numbers of participants it is very hard to interpret what these differences mean, but what you are seeing is that whatever is happening it is not simple, it's not unidirectional, it not only is not affecting men and women always in the same way, it's not even affecting them in the same direction or in the same, although I, what I would say is always within the same brain areas, We're not finding totally different brain areas recruited by these, affected by these things across men and women. So this is hidden away, interestingly, in the... Um, the extra methods for this paper, which is a very interesting paper, and I have to say it's a very thorough, very interesting paper. Lots of stuff online you can look into and play around with in the data. But you might think, just looking at that, I wonder if the only thing that is accounting for the variation in those brains across these different properties of social factors in their lives is the only thing that's affecting this, whether you are male or female. Might there be anything else? Well, there is something else that is affecting the amount of variance explained and that's in this column here so this is the total variation that they're getting and that's the amount that's accounted for by sex effects it is varying between one percent and three percent and three percent is the largest amount of variation here again with romantic partners and friendship satisfaction that is explained by whether or not you are a man or a woman regardless of which direction it all goes in what's in that missing column well it's your age and there you start to see genuinely striking effect. And of course, brains are hugely plastic. Our brains are massively shaped by experience. If anything, the effects that you've, the influences, the experiences you've had in your life, from my perspective, are much more likely to influence brain structure and brain function than whether or not you are male or female. And that's definitely the case for human brains. One after another, as I study psychology and my, you know, the field moves on, things that we thought were basic properties of the human brain turn out to be highly influenced by the cultural things that affect your experience and your development and the things you get to do as you grow up. So for example, my colleague Katie Orcock in Lancaster, she noticed that children, when she was working in Tanzania, who live in a very featureless environment with the children she was working with, seemed to have much better spatial working memory than kids back in Lancaster who could navigate environments by using landmarks. And indeed, that was what she found in terms of their performance on tests. And quite strikingly, that is clearly going to be something to do with what they're doing as they're growing up in a different part of the world. And this just pans out in all directions. And what we're seeing here in this large brain anatomy study is that there are tiny little effects of whether or not you are male or female and enormous effects of age, which is a proxy effectively for your experience. So we need to take a broader view. What happens if we ask slightly more difficult questions? So this I'll accept is a smaller number of participants, but this is a functional brain imaging study done by my friend and colleague Kathy Price at UCL. And what she asked was a question is about reading, a language task classically associated with women doing or believed to do better than men. And what they did was they varied a number of different factors. They tested a lot of people and they tested people who were older and younger, male and female, left and right handed. And what they found was they also asked questions about how you read, because when people read English, they do read English in a number of different ways. There are different strategies you can use to read English, whole word reading or sounding out. 
And what they found was the things that influenced what your brain did when you were reading words aloud was influenced by age and reading strategy. And whether you were male or female effectively had no measurable effect whatsoever in what your brain does, and what brain areas recruited when you read aloud. What makes a difference is how old you are and what makes a difference is how you have how you read. So it's really important to think about this, and I'm sure there are aspects of this actually in that paper I just took you through with all these different brain areas and these different social factors. It's not just hormones that affect what our brain is like or our body is like. How we develop affects how our brains work, what opportunities we have affect what our brain does, and what opportunities we've had even to learn will affect what our brain does. And of course, this is a huge deal. Human brains do not work out of the box. Our brains are massive, and we have this really extended period of being juveniles when we grow these brains, and then they continue being plastic for the whole rest of our life. This is not something that is a work, it's a work in progress at all points, the human brain. It is never a finished product, and it's certainly not something that works as soon as we're on the earth. It does not work out of the box. The only thing I'd add is man alive, do we scientists want the answers to be simpler than that though? And I think this probably rolls out to society as well. I think one of the reasons why this has proved to be a very difficult question to ask sensible questions about, or even to try and be skeptical around aspects of is that we have a culturally a very strong desire for there to be enormous differences between men and women because there are at a societal level huge differences between the opportunities we give male-bodied and female-bodied on individuals. Lots of gendered stuff is somewhat needlessly gendered. I'm not saying that can necessarily always be the case. But our account for this really can be sometimes highly uh, pleasing if actually just based on nothing. So, for example, back in the 90s, there was a real there was a trend for books on this topic. So this the classic being men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Thesis of this is men and women have evolved to have entirely different brains and totally different needs and they'll never get on. My dear old boss in Cambridge read this book when I was working for him and man, that was enjoyable. But around the same time, uh, Deborah Tannen wrote this book, You Just Don't Understand. And there the idea was that women are so much better at using language than men that men just don't understand what's going on really when, men, when they're being talked to. She, she kind of credits men with the sort of uh, the linguistic capabilities of a, uh, maybe a particularly affectionate Labrador. And it's extraordinary. So, you know, we're kind of going around doing all this complicated verbal stuff and men are just going, well, I don't know what's going on. I'm just enjoying getting to hang out. Um, but that's, you know, that, that kind of thing. The scientists are from the same communities. We are part of these same desires. There are these things we want to explain. So here's just a couple of examples of this. Going back to spatial processing, I showed you, again, at a statistical level, you start to pull out these differences, although they're not huge. In this study, they had um, men and women doing a spatial processing task, doing this rotation task. Uh, what they didn't find, actually, was a behavioral difference on their test. The women and the men performed the same. Uh, that didn't stop them from analyzing the results and saying, well, here we go. The men's brains and the women's brains are different when they do this task. They don't compare the male and the female brains because they've got phenomenally no numbers of participants. They've got uh, something fantastic like, yes, six men and five women in this. So in fact, when you compare them directly, those are, there is no difference in the male and female brains. We tried to do a statistical comparison, so they just don't do it. They just present the male and female brains and say, they're different, that's the end of it. And that passed peer review. People are happy with that. If you imagine me saying, I found a difference between French speakers and German speakers, and then tried to illustrate that with five German speakers of six French speakers, I wouldn't get it. I would get desk rejection immediately. I would die of shame. This is a more recent and I'd say somewhat more egregious example of this. So this was a study that actually hit the press a lot nearly 10 years ago. And what this is doing is it's looking at connectivity. So how brain areas talk to each other. And it's looking at them, these brain areas, patterns of connectivity across male and female participants who are teenagers. So these are brains really changing with age. And what they found was there was a difference in the overall difference in the overall patterns of connectivity for the men and the female brains. And they just went huge. This was in every newspaper. The picture that reveals why men and women brains really are different. The connection that mean girls are made for multitasking. Scientists use an MRI imaging to scan the brains of young men and women. Male brains are designed to make them better at carrying out single tasks, while female brains are designed to carry out many tasks simultaneously. I would just like to point out 
there is not a single reference to or provision of any evidence for behavioral differences between the men and the female brains in this study. And more horrifically, they don't present any effects of age, although we know that will be having a big effect. It has a big effect on adults. And really badly, particularly given that the journal wouldn't take a letter about this, the, um, they had behavioral data showing that there was no difference between the boys and the girls, which they were, they were teenagers, on these tests like multitasking or single task performance. They just said the things that the newspapers like and it got in the newspapers and everyone was happy. It was absolutely shocking. So just want to end up with a cautionary tale. This stuff, as I said, does matter. And to go back to this idea about where are the women in STEM, obviously there are some of us there, but computer science is a really good example. So 18% of undergraduates in computer science are women, and that has proved to be very hard to change. If, however, we take a step back, and computer science is interesting because it's a new science, what we can do is from the 1970s onwards track the proportion of women going into different areas of study at university. And throughout the 70s and early 80s, very early 80s, women are going into all these areas and they're going into computer science along with law and physical sciences and medical school. And then in the early 80s, it drops off and they never come back, whereas they're approaching 50% and beyond in other areas. What does this track? Well, this tracks computers coming into the home and great things that they are they were marketed fairly squarely once they were in the home as a high prestigious item a desirable consumer item and they are literally showing boys being shown how to do things on the advert there was no question this is a thing for, for, for the men of the family to share I will admit to being a bit have a, have a sort of dog in this fight. Uh, when I was a teenager, my brother was given not one but two different S S Sinclair ZXs and uh, ZX81s. And I, I wouldn't have crossed my parents' minds to give me one. It wouldn't have, you know, they didn't do anything like that at girls' schools. And I didn't, you know, think that was for me. And I was so much older. Like in my 20s, I did a PhD and I discovered how easy coding is. I couldn't believe it. And people wouldn't have, wouldn't have crossed anybody's mind that it would be something that a girl would do because this is, well, we've got this lovely thing and it's clearly a boy's thing. And I think also it really stops us, this very kind of limited approach we have to asking questions about the effect of biological sex on the brain, the things we want to answer questions about. So we keep going back to mental rotation and maths and chemistry, not chemistry, and, and sort of computer science. But there are other areas where you see genuinely shocking differences between male and female behaviours. And this is a, just a shocking note to end on. This is the UK prison population. How does this break down between men and women? Well, it breaks down like this. Now, that's worse than engineering. That is worse than any other proportion I've ever seen. And strikingly, this is seen wherever you go in the world. So even in very, very low crime countries like Japan, this proportion is still there. And those women are going to prison for things that are different from the things the men have done. Now, I'm not saying this is anything other than a massive failure on our part, whereby we are letting down everybody by not asking better questions about why these men are ending up in these situations. I'm not being trite about it. I think it's a terrible, terrible failure. It's a terrible failure of science. A handful of people have asked questions about this. It's like we're very happy to get caught up on questions about computer science, but we really don't want to know about why men are committing crimes so much more frequently than women. And we are letting these men down. We are letting everyone down by this kind of blinkered issue. We don't even treat this as a, as a gendered topic. We may be just like, oh, everyone's bad that does this, so we don't want to know anything more. It's even difficult to get research funding to study this scientifically. So this is what I mean about getting brain sex wrong. It really matters. It matters because we start trying to explain away things that actually, when you look, don't even require a position on this where you think men and women are doing it at all differently to start with, whereas other areas which are really affecting everybody, these are all, every single statistic here is an unhappy story and ruined lives. We are not even treating this as something that could be asked questions about scientifically, let alone something where we might acknowledge we're letting down a lot of men and a lot of families by this route. So it matters. It's time to start getting brain sex right. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sophie. This um, affectionate Labrador here. 
I'm rather flattered by that description. <laughs> Oddly, has, has got some questions to ask you. Um, of course, we, we all know that what sells a book is one thing and science is something else. So you would hope, yeah. Well, yes, these, <laughs> these people are casting on, on on the public predilections, really, are they? So what about, there's been some experiments with rhesus monkeys, I believe, the baby rhesus monkeys, in which the females were found, they given alternatives to choose from, they were found to prefer to play with dollies, whereas the male baby monkeys were found to prefer to play with cards. Does this indicate anything? Is it, is it a good scientific study? Is there an I mean, innate... I... There's, it's difficult because why would monkeys want, what would a car even mean to monkeys? When I do think that you can, I'm not pretending there can't be behavioral differences. And I think we haven't, we've always managed to phrase things around the absolute requirement for newborn humans to be looked after because they are absolutely helpless and you will lose that baby if you don't have uh, someone on top of it uh, really on that case but we by kind of dismissing it as caring and rather than like you know it, we never sort of position women as like in, you might say well that maybe women have to be really clever to deal with that sort of situation how do you manage this helpless infant and somehow get everyone fed and make sure you don't all die together it's it's diminished so it's, i think we don't take it seriously because we diminish it as a thing so it's entirely possible that the females who will have seen you know there is there's a really good onion article isn't it, about how sexism is rampant in nature but if, if you are in a galada baboon troop then most of the time not even all the time but most of the time most of the dealing with the infants will be done by the females but it's not exclusive and it's not only one female, but that's what they will have seen. You know, they're not tabula rasas, they're not blank plates. Mm. And <laughs> blank plates, not blank plates. So it's not, so I, that would make sense to me. I think the car side of it, I, I, I you know, I, it, I, I would want to know why, what else we looked at, what would be other things that you might be also interesting to all the monkeys. They're novelty seeking animals interested in finding out about their environments. They're always getting their noses in everything. So, you know, I, you'd need to know more. But you also get the opposite. So someone did a study with newborn babies where they showed them faces or they showed them sort of abstract images. And the boys' babies and the girl babies looked the same at the faces. Mm -hmm. And the boys looked slightly more at the abstract images than the girls did. And that got turned into, from the outset, boys care less about faces than girls. <laughs> and that is not what the study showed. The, body, the study showed exactly the same interest in faces for the baby boys and the baby girls, not a difference at all. But you find the difference that, that you want to explain, and, and, then, and that's become what that study shows. It's, it's, you know, and then that's the story. So I'm, I'm skeptical about some of the assumptions, but I'm entirely happy to believe you know, that there would be, that, that's a highly you know, sex specific tendency in primates what that wouldn't surprise me at all for the for the fluffy toy side of things there's a big tendency to go for presuppositionalism isn't there mm. so the problem that we've got is that human brains are so complicated it's difficult to do a controlled investigation isn't it you can't you can't say eliminate all the other factors and focus on one because you have all these interfering age, sex, experience, conflicting factors. Absolutely. And I think what it means is, I mean, I'm all for embracing that complexity and we're starting to get there now. I mean, that's what that study was trying to do. I was being funny about it, but, you know, they are trying to get to grips with the complexity. They've just got very blunt tools. Mm. Um, but I think we are starting to now get, you know, we've got the computational power to be able to handle large data sets. And we are starting to be able to ask bigger questions about, you know, hopefully more subtle questions just about the kinds of things that have really big influences on our brains and when it has to happen. So I've been, I've been really struck 
I've been reading two different papers. A, a study by my colleague Tamar Makin, who works with people who've born without arms, mm. and she looks at their representation of their toes. And what she finds is their brains have very different representations of their toes than people who have arms, who don't use their toes in the same way. Yeah. But you have to have been born that way. Yeah. If you start painting, and these are people that you know do toe painting, things like that. If you lose your arms and you start using your feet in a different way, you are likely to start being able to do very different things with your feet than you were before, because now you have to. It doesn't mm. change your brain in the same way. Oh. Mm. So, and we find the same with music. So music has tremendous influences on how you process information and there's you know, lots and lots of, uh, you know, you learn to play musical instruments and it comes with a lot of other skills. If you want to see your brain look different, mm. you have to start learning that musical instrument when you're about three. Yes, yeah. So some of the physical stuff that we're, we're still measuring in this relatively crude way, that we're able to see in this crude way anyway, probably has to be happening at a very, very early age to have these big plastic effects. And there's going to be other things on there afterwards, but it's not going to have these gross kind of structural effects that we, that's the easiest stuff to measure, to be frank. So I think it, it's going to be difficult, but I think also we, we're not asked, we're not paying enough attention to the really big influences that are happening in early years. And people are starting to do that now. So one of the things, one of the reasons why people don't scan the brains of very small children is because people have got to lie still when they're being scanned. And yeah. <laughs> I think we're all familiar with the problems that might present. But there are these techniques now um, called functional near infrared spectroscopy, where you can basically just make a hat and wear the hat and it doesn't give you the whole brain but it gives you a lot more kind of functional grasp on what the brain's doing and you can do it babies will tolerate it it's not different from any cap you pop on a baby and so there's labs in ucl and labs in cambridge looking at this like rob cooper my colleague at ucl and i think that might start to give us like a bit more of a toehold on these really critical years that might then you know when we're able to look at the brain in more detail we'll actually be able to see the effects of that, I suspect. So the technology will catch up with us, but that's that's frankly why we haven't done it so far. It's hard. Yes. It's hard to look at baby. We look forward to the future. Mm. So, so this not changing the brain before uh, after the age of three makes me ask, is that an explanation for indoctrination? <laughs> I, I, I well I have to say, well, I, when I say no change the structure of the brain, I mean with a very crude effect to say this bit's bigger than that bit. You know, with, with, so the stuff we're using is amazing, but it's still, you know, incredibly gross in terms of the yeah. fine detail of the brain. So it's entirely possible, you know, if anything that you've learned from my talk today happened because your brain changed, you know, so you can have brain changes without these big morphological changes, but yeah. the morphology is where we're looking. So that's... So possibly, but at the, at the level at which we're, the morphological stuff I'm describing is extremely crude. Yes. So it, it, we're not in a position to be able to say that you can bake things in to a toddler that they will never be able to get out of for the rest of their life. I, I would definitely hope that that was not true. I mean, I don't yeah. think there's, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good news. Yes. <laughs> can, can you tell us a bit about the actual process of fMRI? Because... I believe that uh, Sam Harris was one of the earliest people to use that. He did his PhD, which watched people thinking while they were shown images that were either of known pro propositions or of propositions that you had to consider whether they were true or not. Do you, Can you talk about that? So fMRI... Well, Magnetic resonance imaging in total is basically quantum physics. It's quite extraordinary. And it uh, comes about by placing tissue within a very big magnet. So you've got this big magnet and you're placed inside it. And what that does is the tissue is magnetized. By magnetized, it means that the spins of the hydrogen molecules or the hydrogen atoms in molecules in the tissue that you're looking at start to spin in the same orientation. So they're processing, they're wobbling around their spin in the same orientation. And then what you do is you introduce a disruption to that magnetic field 
with a radio frequency pulse and they all get knocked off together and then when you turn off the, the radio frequency pulse they swing back and they mm -hmm. swing back at roughly different speeds depending on what tissue they're in what molecule they're in so if they're in mm -hmm. water they move slightly differently than if they're in a fat molecule and this lets you image all sorts of parts of the body in tremendous detail lots of body tissue stands up very well to that kind of contrast because you're effectively looking at the difference between fat and water bone doesn't show up at all well and so that gives us beautiful anatomical pictures particularly of the brain because the brain is completely chock full of fat and water and then for functional imaging fmri what you do is you take advantage of the fact two properties so oxygenated and deoxygenated blood have got slightly different paramagnetic qualities so you can track the proportion of oxygenation in any bit of blood and when your brain does more work immediately more blood is directed to that right. area so you're picking up brain activity in terms of neural activity via this indirect link which is as soon as yeah. there's neural activity more blood is sent there and then you're picking up yeah. this difference in the oxygenation levels so it is indirect it's nothing like the precision of single cell recordings that you can do with um other animals or even like electrode recordings that you can do on the surface of the skull sorry the surface of the brain for people having brain surgery but mm. being able to look at healthy brains and look at brain systems it's fantastic. Mm. Yes, this is uh, the start of a new era, really, isn't it? Yes, we're still at the start. It, it, it's very early days. We've only had this technique for, oh, it's, you know, 20 years. It's extraordinary. No, 25 mm. years, 25, 30 years. Mm. But it's come into common use uh, over the last 20 years. So it, it's, it's progressing very quickly now. Mm. So your specializ specialism is voice isn't it and and laughter and of course voice is about communication it's not just words is it it's intonation and inflection and it, that enables us to even reverse the meaning of the words we're using and yes. say something ironically yes. or even make it malicious and say it sarcastically and so i'm wondering you also mentioned music too and i'm wondering whether where does song fit into this um, communication I think so one of the things that's really interesting about the human voice and human speech is that it's it's incredibly complex and it rests on these evolutionary adaptations that uh, we've made to existing things that we're using for breathing or chewing so we haven't evolved a new thing to have a voice it's all changes to what we already have but we could only talk once those changes had taken place. Mm -hmm. um, and so things like we have this descended larynx that I showed you and mm -hmm. this very flat face, those need to be in place before we can speak. And so something else must have driven the adaptations. And we're the only animal that can choke because of our descended larynx. And people yeah. do choke. It's a very common way of dying. So it's an absolute yeah. evolutionary trade-off. Yeah. But something pushed it, not speech. It's, it had to be there before speech happened. And there is a plausible argument that actually that's song. Really? That mm. what you have when you have the breath control that we have and you have this descended larynx mm. is the capability of controlling your breath for song and to be able to modulate the pitch over with a lot more flexibility and over a longer duration than if you didn't yeah. have that kind of control. Yeah. And then speech kind of comes in on top of that. So there's always melody to speech. It's just we tend not to notice it, as you say, unless somebody's going, you know, I remember the, seeing the Sex Pistols on television when I was a kid and they're going, oh, we really love the Queen or something. I was like, oh, I don't think they love the Queen at all. What's going on here? You know, but that yeah. kind of mismatch, you sometimes realise it. But it's yeah. always there. Yeah. Speech, the, yeah. the voice is effectively always a musical instrument. It's just because speech is such a salient yeah. characteristic of it in terms of communication. That tends to be what we latch onto. But in fact, you're yes. always processing it in, in its totality. We even notice it when it's minimal, when, when somebody's voice is monotonous. Yep. Yep. Mm. It's never neutral. So I've got a question to come. I'm going to put it on the screen for us. Here's the one from Will. Oh, well, <laughs> think of a question, isn't it? Eh? Well, I don't know where consciousness comes from. Good answer. But, but 
I think it is interesting if you start to ask questions about the things that we are conscious of and the things that we are a lot less conscious of. So, um, for example, a lot of the things that we have that are most easily brought to consciousness are more to do with example for sort of recognizing and naming and managing information in your environment, stuff to do with the temporal lobe, basically in a way that a lot of stuff to do with motor control, we have no conscious awareness of, and it's very, very hard to gain any of. So, you know, I can pick up a pen and start writing. I could not tell somebody how to write, actually to describe that thing. No, so no. there's, so we have fantastic kind of awareness and descriptive experience of a huge amount of the stuff in our environment. And then loads of other stuff, like how I'm staying standing up, Yes. I have no ability to even start to realize that I'm doing any work to manage it. So it's not an answer, but I think the only other thing I'd say is that something that's interesting about the temporal lobes is that they are evolutionarily more recent. Mm -hmm. So if you think of everything that you see in brains, so you get something that resembles a brain quite as soon as you get multicellular organisms that have some sort of sensory control or sensation then you start to cluster them together into what becomes a head because it makes sense to do things that way um so you get these and then the next step is not just sensing but acting and sort of joining those two things together so as brains get more elaborate in it's very hard to obviously draw a line because this is happening along a tree but very very roughly mm. as brains get more complex the first stuff that gets built in is all the stuff to do with controlling, sensing what's out there and controlling your actions around it, either running towards it or running away from it. And then when more stuff gets built in, it's to do with emotional processing and memory. And then when more stuff gets built in, often around these memory systems, that's when you start to see the temporal lobes. And that's when you start to get animals that are like elephants and dolphins and dogs and humans, where you see not just a sort of reactivity to the world like you know if you, if you go to london zoo when you can get in there they'll let you handle an alligator skull and at the back there's a hole like that big and that's its mm. brain its whole brain yeah. fits in there now in the yeah. water i would not bet against the alligator and me with my huge brain it works very well for the right situation so there's that's mm. all it needs you know so we've got all this other elaborated stuff which obviously not one single thing maps onto but i think it is it's interesting to sort of speculate on this more recent elaboration, the temporal lobe. Often it's stuff pertaining to that and how it talks to the rest of the brain that we are most easily conscious of. I'm not saying it's the only thing we could be conscious of. So there might be something there. Look at the evolutionary growth of the brain might give us some clues. Yeah, of course, dualists don't like this progression argument. <laughs> they, they go right back to sort of a, basic causes and they say that there's the material which is the brain and then there's the immaterial which is consciousness and consciousness has intentionality and the material world doesn't so therefore there must be a separate soul not part of the organ in our brain well i <laughs> I, I, I can't lie to you. I can't take a strong position on this. I think the only thing I'd add is that whatever consciousness is doing, it's not much use for a lot of stuff. So if you are out for a jog and you trip, if you waited on conscious processes to stop you from falling, you would be mm. lying on the cold floor thinking I've fallen. Yes. Um, whereas, I mean, it does. It is quite. I mean, it happens to you. It's amazing. I mean, you know, when you catch yourself stumbling and just all this stuff starts kicking in, and yes. you do a couple of funny steps, and then you're going in, and you have no idea how you do it, and you're in it before you know it's happening, yeah. because yeah. all the evidence is that the stuff we're conscious of happened about two hundred milliseconds ago. Yes. Yes. So there's always this lag, and because it's always there, you don't notice it. But the time you notice it is when something else kicks in that is seeing stuff with a much finer grained sense, you know, kind of temporal reality. And that's yeah. the motor, these sensory motor systems, these older systems. Yeah. So they are up to speed because they have to be, otherwise you'd fall over all yeah. the time. Almost and fine. then you make, well, what, what is it for then? If it's not, again, and I'm going back to an evolutionary argument here, but then 
all these other things that consciousness is really useful for over a longer time scale, like, you know, kind of managing your emotional state or thinking back over something that happened and working out stuff about it or thinking creatively or exploring the world without having to actually physically move, all that kind of thing. I don't think we've given enough weight to that as actually a really useful thing for humans to be able to do. We, yeah. we kind of want an immediate value to it. So we want consciousness in the driving seat and mm. consciousness might be, you know, the driving seat might be a really kind of dumb sensory motor system, whereas consciousness is in the back of the car having an interesting conversation about free will, you know? Yeah. Well, the, the reflex action system couldn't possibly work if it was 300 or 200 milliseconds lag. Exactly. You, you'd be hit by the cricket ball before you pulled it. Yes. <laughs> Things yeah. pouncing off your face all the time. Yeah. 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 So here's another question. This one's from Steve. Uh, where's it gone? Yeah, here. Um, I think that's a very, so the question is about do men and women perform similarly in mental rotation tasks if times taken is not considered? I would be absolutely prepared to believe that. I was actually just reading a paper this afternoon. The paper I got that data from where they showed that you've got this difference between men and women when you are having to do the mental rotation task by just looking at a piece of paper. If you do it in a virtual reality environment where people can actually move around, men and women perform exactly the same. So they were arguing exactly like you're saying, actually, that maybe some of the differences we pick up are more to do with the, you know, some sort of motoric aspect of the response. And if you change that or you alter the constraints on it, as you're suggesting, that you don't see these differences. And I think that's entirely possible. I mean, I think it's very, very unlikely that mental rotation is some basic unit of human cognition that is just different across people in a way that can't be varied. I would be very very surprised if it wasn't something that we you know most of what we do we learn to do and therefore how you learn to do it and the way you learn to do it could be something that influences exactly the kind of thing you're talking about mm. it's all about learning again yes. so here's one this is our friend conrad who is watching us from canada So the question here is, do uh, Robert Plowman argues that genetics accounts for intelligence ability to a greater degree than upbringing and life choices. Do you agree? Well, I think it's very, very hard to separate some of these things out. So all the evidence is, you know, at one level, strongly in favour of the kind of thing that you're describing there. There is those very good evidence for aspects of that. I think the difference comes if you then say that other things couldn't be influencing the stuff that affects the opportunities that you have and the, um, the chances you have to do things. So I think a really good example to go back to is actually music. So one of the problems with the sort of unpicking the music in the brain literature is that to see big brain differences and brain responses that are based on your, le your learning of music you have to have started at a very young age. And that immediately takes you to a very specific group of musicians. Most people do not have that opportunity, even yeah. in Western countries. It's mm. not something that happens to people who are poorer. It's not something, there's all sorts of other things that feed into it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and there's I the child prodigy effect, isn't there? Well, I mean, I, th I suppose the bottom line is that there clearly is. You just have to take the, um, I think the problem with the IQ debate is that it's sort of, we miss the fact that actually even the, the very don't dim human brains are still amazing brains. You know, humans are so clever. We are ridiculously clever. We're phenomenally clever apes, but there has this big valence to it. I think if you just step back and say, one of the things we're learning very clearly from the study of genetics and brain structure and how they relate is there are so many possible dimensions along which people can vary and they almost certainly have a very strong genetic component to them. So a good example of this would be Simon, oh, I'm forgetting his surname, a guy who does research on language in Nijmegen, and he's finding all these different, you have to do huge chunks of the population, do genetic analysis on them, and then give them language tasks. 
but things like facility in language, just normally varying facility in language, seems to have an incredibly strong genetic component. But it's so kind of spread, we don't pick it up as something that maps simply onto different aspects of life. And you might mean, therefore, someone who's got, if they have the opportunity to learn many languages, they do so very easily. But if they never have those opportunities, they're still never going to have, the, they, won't, they, won't, they won't magic up from somewhere else. So you're always seeing this, conf, this kind of interaction of what is clearly a dizzying pattern of the influences that your genetics has on your brain and how that then interacts with your environment. But all of it's still dependent on you having those opportunities ever to try them. Yes, yes. Of course, the, the evolution of language is itself a huge area of work at the moment, isn't it? Yes. Yes. That, that's a for another night, I think. I think so. It's always worth bearing in mind that the French Academy of Sciences banned all discussion about the evolution of language yes. at yes. the end of the 19th century because it yes. always got so ill-tempered, which is always yes. salutary to remember. Yeah. Yes. They spent a long time prescribing English words, didn't they? That <laughs> is English. <laughs> Anyway, Sophie, this has been fantastic. I'm, I'm cutting you off now because we've, I've let you overrun our hour because you were so fascinating. Um, but I, I, want to, I want to end by referencing the probably apocryphal tale about the bishops in uh, Macon, I think, uh, who got together and discussed whether women are human. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if we let men have language, let's let women be human. That's, like, <laughs> I don't know whether you've heard that, that story. But, That's lovely. Yes. <laughs> it's, uh, it's because um, homo sapiens means man. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Great. And I want to announce to our local viewers that Sophie has agreed to, because she's a comedian in her spare time. She moonlights as a stand-up and she has agreed to be our guest when we go back to the pub in Worthing for our seventh birthday. You remember last year we had Robin Ince, this year in October, assuming that you know we can meet in a pub again by then, it's Sophie Scott. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.